So this start of this passage is about the supremacy of Christ over the priests. So we know the book, main, main theme is that Jesus is superior. He is superior to all. So if you turn with me back to chapter 2, we've already read this, but I want to revisit this just briefly. Chapter 2, verses 17 through 3, 1. Chapter 2, 17, we touched on this a few weeks ago about Jesus being supreme over the priests. Chapter 2, verse 17 through chapter 3, verse 1. Just a couple verses here, three verses says, therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things that he might became, become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Verse uh, one of chapter three, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So back to Hebrews chapter four, verse 14, the passage we're talking about this morning. The first thing I wanna talk about is the two commands of this passage, the two verbs basically of this passage. The first one is carefully hold on to your testimony of Christ. This is in verse one. Therefore, since we have a great High priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So carefully hold on to your testimony, your confession of Christ. This idea of let us hold fast, it's one word, it's one word. It's a verb and it's one word in the original language. It means to hold in the hand, to not discard or let go, to keep carefully and faithfully, to continue to hold and to retain. So carefully hold on to, faithfully hold on to, continually hold on to what? Let us hold fast, the writer says, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold fast our confession. This is a, a profession. Subjectively, it means whom we, po- we uh, profess to others or to be ours. And then objectively, it's a profession. It's what one professes, all right? So it's who we profess and it's what one is professing. So the writer is not saying, hold on to your confession, your testimony, like holding Christ close to your chest where no one can see him, like coddling a, a pet gerbil. The writer's not saying, hold your testimony close to you so that no one can see it because it's yours. That's not what he's saying. And he's not saying, be sure and go out and evangelize your confession Be sure and go out and evangelize and speak about Jesus louder and more. That's not what he's saying. Given all the previous passages about them wavering in their faith and them hearing the story of their forefathers who could not enter God's rest, the writer is saying, he's telling them, hold on tightly to Jesus whom you have confessed. Remember him. Remember Jesus. Hold on tightly to him. Don't let go of him. Faithfully continue in holding on to Jesus until the end. He's saying, don't lose heart. In essence, don't give up. Even though times are tough, hold on to Jesus because Jesus gets you and he gets what you're going through. Persevere in your relationship, in your confession of Jesus. Hold on to your testimony tightly. Hold on to your testimony tightly. Verse one since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. We hold on to our testimony because we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. So the high priest of the Levitical law versus the great high priest. Jesus, according to this passage, is not just a high priest. He is the great high priest. He's the great high priest. Martin Luther says he is the greatest of all priests. Jews, who would have been an audience in hearing this letter read or reading it themselves, Jews would have interpreted this as the great, great priest, the highest priesthood above all Levitical high priests. So the writer is building his argument that Jesus is superior to all high priests because he is the great high priest. And they revered these high priests so highly These are the people they trusted on to be the mediator between them and God. 
And the writer's saying Jesus is greater than those high priests. He is the great high priest. And what has he done? He's passed through the heavens. This great high priest has passed through the, through the heavens. William Barclay explains that even as expansive as heaven is, heaven itself is too small a place for Jesus. The poet Christina Rossetti said heaven cannot hold him. So we want to get a picture here of the high priest who the readers or the audience would have been thinking about. They would have related this to all the high priests that God had set forth through the Aaron priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, that God would have set forth to make sacrifices for their sins. So we have that high priest. And then we have Jesus, the great high priest. So there's a comparison that the writer's making. So once a year, the high priest would pass through the outer courts, through the holy place, into the holy of holies once a year to sacrifice for the sins of the Israelites. Out of sight from the onlookers, he would go into this holy of holies by himself to the temporary throne of God and make a sacrifice. That's what the high priest would do. Jesus, the great high priest, he passed from the domain of this world, from the domain of this world, he passed from this world and once and for all into the holiest of holies, not just the holy of holies, but the holiest of holies, the heavens where the throne of God is, to this day, he passed as he ascended out of the sight of his onlookers to the permanent throne of God. So you see the comparison? We have the high priest that would have gone from the outer court past the holy, of hol past the holy place into the holy of holies once a year to a permanent throne. Jesus, our great high priest, has passed from this earth with onlookers seeing him go at his ascension passing through not just to a holy place, but to the holiest of holies permanently, not just temporary on our behalf. This is what has happened when it says he has passed through the heavens. What has he done there? Well, he prepared, he prepared a place for us there. That's what he's done. In John chapter 14, verse one, it says, do not let your heart be troubled. Jesus is saying, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, this permanent throne in my father's house are many dwelling places if it were not so i would have told you for i go to prepare a place for you as he passes through to the holiest of holies i go to prepare a place for you if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you to myself that where i am there you may be also and you know the way where i am going and thomas said to him he said lord we don't know where you're going how do we know the way and jesus said to him i am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. So he passed from this place, this domain, Jesus, who walked on the earth for 30 plus years, 33 years, walked on the earth. He passed from this domain into the permanent throne of God. So why do we carefully hold on to our testimony of Christ? Why would we carefully, why would the writer say carefully hold on to your testimony? Carefully hold on to your confession of Christ. Because as our great high priest, he's passed through the heavens and he has opened the door for us. He has given us access to hold on to our confession. When times get tough, we need to go back to what we know is true. We need to recall the time that Jesus saved us. Recall the time that Jesus saved you. Remember the time that you confessed him. Hold on to that confession. Hold on to that. When others are looking at you, what do they see? Do they see that your identity is in Christ? Do they see that your identity, that your confession is that of Christ? Do they see that in your lives? Are you a new creation in front of people? Do people see that confession? Do they see that you're a new creation? The old confession of self, selfishness and self-righteousness and, and being able to do things on your own and whatever it is, the old creation is gone. The new has come is what the Bible says. And then ask yourself, what is my Christian witness? Sometimes all we have is our Christian witness. What is your Christian witness? What is your Christian witness? What do people see? And then do, your, do you even share your testimony of Christ? Do you do it boldly, without shame, that you share your testimony, your confession of Christ? When we are focused inwardly, we're not holding on to our confession of Christ. Because of Christ, 
We need to make a conscious effort of confessing him and letting our life be one that gives and doesn't just take. That's the confession of Christ, is we are givers. We're no longer takers. We speak life into people. We no longer speak death because we're different. We're holding on to our confession of Christ. And this causes us to live very differently. We truly do live for the kingdom of God. We don't just live for this world. We live for the kingdom. That's our confession. Paul said, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. May I never boast, may I never brag about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. May I boast only in the cross. And then the writer says, confidently approach the throne of Christ. We can confidently, verse 16, confidently approach this throne of grace this throne of God. We go confidently if we know Christ. And the writer's saying, go confidently. Hold on to your confession and then confidently approach the throne of grace. He says, therefore, let us draw near. He starts by saying this, therefore, let us draw near. Well, let us draw near. It's also one word. Let us draw near is also one word in the original language. It literally just means come near, visit. It means to worship, to assent to. And verse 15 says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. So we can confidently approach the throne of grace, the throne of Christ. We can draw near. We draw near to it because we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. We have the great high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. This word sympathize is sympatheo. It's a compound word from soon, which means together with and pasco, which means to suffer. So literally what this means is to suffer with. The word sympathize means to suffer with. So the recipients of this letter, they needed to hear this. They needed to hear that Jesus, that this high priest whom they have confessed and they're wavering in their faith, they needed to hear that this Jesus sympathizes with them. Literally, it would say, we have a high priest who can sympathize with us. And these readers needed to hear this. They needed the assurance that they had a savior who not only suffered for them, but he suffers with them. That he alone could sympathize with what they're going through. What were they going through? Well, they were struggling in their faith and many were facing or they were soon to face some kind of a suffering for their faith. At the very least, they were shunned by their families, because they professed Christ. They made a confession. They held on to that confession, and they said, Jesus is my Savior. I'm no longer following this religion. I am following Jesus. So they, at the very least, were shunned by their families and shunned by their former religion, shunned by their heritage, shunned by their tradition, maybe completely and physically cast out from their community and from their family. They said, you are no longer my son. You are no longer my daughter. You are no longer my father. You are no longer my mother. That's at the very least what they were facing when they confessed Christ. And so Jesus is saying that I can understand because I sympathize. I am suffering with you. And then at the most, they were facing death for their faith. So persecution was not at its height yet, the time that the book of Hebrews was written. But under Emperor Nero, which is during the time period, Emperor Nero reigned from 54 AD to 68 AD. That's about the time period they believe that Hebrews was written. Well, we know that Emperor Nero, he persecuted Christians. He killed Christians for sport. There was a a fire in Rome that burned the majority of Rome in AD 64. And Nero, they say he probably is the one that started it for whatever sick reason, and he blamed the Christians. So now, he began torturing Christians for amusement, lighting them on fire in his front yard, pouring oil on them and just lighting them for sport as him and his friends sat on their balcony and watched the Christians burn to death. So there is persecution. So the, the audience of Hebrews, as they're hearing this, would say, wow, Jesus not only suffered for me, but he suffers with me. He sympathizes with what I am going through. He knows what I'm going through. The apostle Peter wrote during the same time period of this persecution under Nero, he writes, he says, for you have been called for this purpose. 
You've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. One who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Similar passage that the writer of Hebrews is talking about here. So the recipients of the letter needed to know this. They needed to know that they had a great high priest who was not just distant from them, who lived in some hierarchy, hierarchical house where he was, he was the one who everybody went to and, and praised him and held him in some high regard. No, he was the great high priest who sympathized and suffered alongside them and understood what they were going through. Do you need this today? Do you need to know that you have a savior, a high priest who sympathizes with you? Do you need comfort from this Jesus and the word, knowing that he sympathizes, he understands you? Believe in this, believe in Jesus, believe that he says, I sympathize with you. I suffer alongside you. I know what you're going through. Run to Jesus in this because he's the one and only person who truly knows what you're going through today. When he was on the cross, he had you on, on his mind. He had me on his mind. When he was on that cross, he thought of us. He thought of us. And he says, he's imploring each of us right now, cast your burdens on me because I care for you. That's what the scripture says. Cast your burdens on him because he cares for you. Cast them on him. The brokenness that you might be feeling today, cast it on him. He does not leave us as orphans, but as adopted sons and daughters. That's what the scripture tells us. And he was forsaken so that you and I do not have to be forsaken. Jesus was forsaken on our behalf. So trust him in this. Today, trust him in this, that he sympathizes with you. And then the writer says, not only is Jesus a high priest who can sympathize with us, verse 15b, but one who has been tempted in all things that we are yet without sin. Not only can he sympathize with us, but he also can identify with us, saying that I have been tempted in every way that you have been tempted yet without sin. We briefly think about this and then we move on. We think, well, yeah, of course, because he was Jesus, he didn't give in to it. And we gloss over this, I think. I know when I read this, I gloss over and think, well, yeah, it was Jesus. Of course he he was able to keep from sinning. But pause for a moment. Really consider this. Consider this. Consider the implications of this. What would this have really meant for Jesus? That he was tempted in all ways that you and I were. Tempted in all ways. Well, when we're tempted, we do one of two things. The first is we give in to the temptation, sometimes immediately. When we're tempted, we sometimes just give in immediately to the temptation. Right When we give into the temptation, we don't experience the grueling depth of what the temptation presents for us because we succumb so easily and quickly and there is this, most often, this temporary relief when we give into the temptation. Hebrews 11 says that sin is pleasurable for even a season. So this means that there is temporary relief from the temptation when we give into it and we go ahead and sin this counterfeit relief that we experience that doesn't really truly satisfy our deepest longing, but it takes us away from the temptation that we're facing. We give into the temptation, we sin, and there is this counterfeit temporary relief. Yes, yes, we do, we do. Well, when Jesus was tempted, not just tempted after, after the wilderness experience, but tempted in every way that you and I have ever been tempted and without sin, when he was tempted, just as we are in all things, he never gave in to the temptation. Never gave in to the temptation to, relieve, to receive some, some temporary relief. So he endured every temptation that was thrown at him every single day, tempted as we are, yet without sin. So he was literally tempted to the maximum to the maximum that he could have been tempted. Here's what William Barclay says about this. The fact that Jesus was without sin means that he knew depths and tensions and assaults of temptation which we never know and never can know. Why? We fall to temptation long before the tempter has put out the whole of his power. We never know temptation at its fiercest and its most terrible because we fall long before that stage is reached. But Jesus was tempted as we are and far beyond what we are. For in his case, the tempter put everything he possessed into the assault 
and Jesus withstood it. That's what it means when we say Jesus was tempted as we are. Let's not gloss over that. Let's remember that he was tempted because he can identify with you and me. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, he says, a silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. You find out the strength of a wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives into temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. That's why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They've lived a sheltered life by always giving in. Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation means. So know today that Jesus knows your temptation. He knows your struggle. He knows it. He has been tempted to the max in that very thing that you are being tempted with. Whatever it might be, whatever the temptation might be, to look or to think or to do something you know you shouldn't do, or to wallow, to to have a, a, a woe is me attitude, to be depressed, to be bitter, to be angry, whatever it is, Jesus knows. He's saying, I sympathize with you, I suffer with you. You know, our bodies can withstand a lot of pain. Our bodies can, can, can uh, withstand a lot of pain. But for most of us, at some point, our bodies will shut down. Our bodies will begin to shut down. So we'll either go into shock, maybe we'll go numb, or we'll faint. When I was a little kid, I was walking home. I, I lived in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the elementary school was about a half a mile of where, from where I lived. And we had to walk through kind of the the desert area, and then there was a dirt road. And, and one day, my sister and I, I was probably seven or eight years old, walking home, and we saw, we heard this kind of ruckus on the dirt road ahead of us. We couldn't see because of the trees, but we saw what obviously was a wreck, and dust just stirred up, and, and uh, we get there, and by the time we get to it, the ambulance is already there, and we walk behind because the, or excuse me, when we, we see kind of what happens. And so they want to ask us, well, what did you see? And so we tell them, well, we saw the truck flip and what have you. And when we get there, we're standing in the back by the ambulance. And I'm just a little boy. And this young guy, probably to me, he looked like a man, but he was probably a teenager, was sitting there. I, couldn't, I can't, I'll never forget this. He was sitting there and his scalp was hanging off the side of his head. But he was just sitting there, just kind of scratching his cheek well did he was he not experiencing pain and I thought man that's so weird he's like totally handling it well you know and because his body had gone into shock he wasn't experiencing the pain anymore our bodies have a mechanism God has created us a way to do that well that's similar to this idea of temptation we succumb to temptation too quickly we don't experience the full brunt of what the temptation would be as Jesus has. Because Jesus never gave in. He is the example of perfect perseverance for us. So the first thing we often do, and sometimes immediately, is we, we give in to the temptation. But the second thing we can do is we can also flee the temptation. The Bible tells us that, that we can flee the temptation. It's clear. Flee youthful lusts. Run from evil desires. Resist the devil. Charles Spurgeon says, say no to temptation. This is what he says. What settings are you in when you fall? Avoid them. What props do you have that support your sin? Eliminate them. What people are you usually with? Avoid them. There are two equally damning lies Satan wants us to believe. Number one, it just won't hurt. Number two, now that you've ruined your life, you're beyond God's use and might as well enjoy sinning. Learn to say no, it will be of more use to you than to be able to read Latin. That's what Charles Spurgeon says. So we can have a lot of success in this area. We can have a lot of success in, in combating and fleeing from temptation. But until we go be with Jesus, we are often going to lose this battle. We can get a testimony in here that that is true. So the point the writer is making is that Jesus never lost the battle. Jesus never lost the battle. And the battle was always a full onslaught from the devil. So because Jesus is our high priest, 
because he's our high priest and he has paved the way for us. And because he has been tempted in all ways yet without sin, the Bible says here in Hebrews that we can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. So we can go confidently to the throne of grace. It's what verse 16 says right in the middle. Draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. The Jews knew that God's throne was a throne of judgment. That's what they thought of when they thought of the throne of God. This is a throne of judgment. And that it could only be approached once a year. But now, with the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, the great high priest, the one who has passed through the heavens, the one who has purchased a permanent place for you and for me in heaven, now that this has happened, we can draw near to the heavenly throne of grace always not just once a year. We can always go to the throne of grace. We can confidently approach the throne of Christ, open to each individual who trusts in Jesus. And the audience of Hebrews, they needed to be reminded of this truth. The truth was that there was no high priest needed for each of them to have their sins atoned for and for them to approach their God. Now they could confidently go to the throne of God because the final great high priest had torn that dividing curtain, the veil that separated them from the Holy of Holies. That had been torn when Jesus died on the cross, giving full access to every believer to come in and go straight to Jesus himself, go to the, go to the throne, the great uh, throne of God, this throne of grace. It was through the blood of Jesus, not through the blood of goats. So what are these implications for us? How does this uh, apply to you and me? What are the implications for you and me? Well, MacArthur says that any formal religious priesthood on earth now implies that the final and perfect atonement for sin has not yet been made. So any priesthood or religious system that we try to follow now to approach the throne of grace that's a saying that, that we don't recognize what God has done. And he says, there is absolutely no place in the economy of Christianity for a priesthood. There's no place for it. In the economy of Christianity, there is no place for a priesthood. We don't need a priesthood. We don't need a high priest. We don't need a, a father that we go to and sit and confess our sins to so that they can take them to the throne of grace. We no longer need that. And he says, any that is established is illegitimate and a direct affront to the full and final priesthood of Jesus Christ himself. Those of us who have been saved by Jesus, we've been born again, we're followers of Jesus. According to the Bible, the Bible says that we are a royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. If you are a follower of Christ, you are a royal priesthood. It's the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. We are a royal priesthood priesthood. We go straight to Jesus. We go straight to the throne of grace. We don't go through a single person. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, and that is the man Christ Jesus. There's only one mediator between us and God, and that's Jesus. And he paid the sacrifice so that we have full access that we can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. We have full access to this throne where God, our Father, and Jesus, our Savior, they reside. Based solely and completely on Jesus alone, period. Jesus alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Solus Christus, in Christ alone are we able to go to this throne because of what Jesus has done. In his book, Don't Just Stand There, But Pray Something, Ron Dunn, he tells what he learned at the end of a really bad day. He had a really bad day, and then he recognized, man, I didn't spend time praying this morning. So his day wore on, and, and it just, it just uh, wore him out all day, and he realized, man, I didn't pray. I didn't have my quiet time. So when the day finally ended, he knelt to pray, and this is what he said, Lord, I've made a mess of my life today. And I confess that I am not worthy to come into your presence, thinking about his day and how he didn't start his day out right with the Lord. And at, the point, at that point, he felt that the Lord uh, interrupted his prayer. And this is what he felt the Lord saying. Ron, 
Do you think having a quiet time this morning would have made you worthy to talk to me? Do you think doing good and treating people right would have somehow made you qualified to come into my present presence? If that's what you think, you don't know yourself, you don't know me, and you don't understand the grace of God. Pastor Ray Pritchard, he says that we all have a ticket that states admission to the throne room of heaven. We have a ticket. This is what Pritchard says. We are accepted by God only on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done. How dare we, listen to this, how dare we have the tattered rags of a quiet time and think that somehow that makes, us, makes a difference in heaven. And he says, I'm all for having a quiet time and all for treating people right and totally on the side of living for the Lord, but all of that cannot add even a tiny sliver to our acceptance before God. It's either all by grace or not by grace at all. That is the access that we have to the throne of God, not based on I had a good quiet time this morning, or I treated my wife or my husband good this morning, or I read an extra chapter in my Bible this morning. It's because of what Jesus did. The tattered rags of our quiet time, the tattered rags of our own righteous deeds, they are filthy to God. We only have access to this throne because of what Jesus has done. Let us always remember that, that it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So when you're part of my family, you can come into my house. When you're part of my family, my condo, actually, my apartment condo, you can come in. Right, You don't have to prove yourself by doing something for me. You don't have to bring me a gift to come into my home. I, would, I like gifts, but you don't have to bring a gift when you come to my home. You may have to knock, but that's only to let me know that you're out the door. If you texted me beforehand, you could just come on in. Come on in. You have the right as my friend, as my brother, my sister in Christ, in the family of God, you have the right in my home to just come in as my brother and sister. If you need something, ask and I will give it to you as part of this family. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And the one to him who knocks, it will be opened. So you can come with confidence to my house and I'm gonna let you in. I'm gonna let you in as my friend, as my brother, my sister. And we can confidently approach the throne of Christ. He's given us that right as his children, as his sons, his daughters, as his friends, as his bride, as the bride of Christ. We have the right to go into the throne of grace. We draw near to this throne of grace as co-heirs with Christ. This is grace. We get it based on what Jesus has done, not on deserving it. That's grace. It's what Jesus has done, not on something we've done. This is our position as followers of Jesus. And then look at the end of verse 16. We'll finish up with this. Look at the end of verse 16. So let me read the whole verse. Let us therefore, because of all this, because Jesus is our high priest, because Jesus has passed through the heavens, because Jesus can sympathize with us, because he's been tempted, let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. When we draw near to the throne of grace, we find mercy and we find grace to help in time of need. This is the result. We will find mercy and we will find the grace to get through this time of need. So know that Jesus sympathizes with you and he knows if you are going through something right now where you need him, draw near to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and find grace to help you in the time of need. So we are carefully to hold on to our confession. We hold on to it. We remember it. We remember it. We build a monument around our confession of Christ. And we go back to that and we say, this is what happened. This is the process. And this is the day I was born again. This was when Jesus saved me. We hold on to that confession. We don't waver in it. And then we are to approach the throne of grace with confidence because the sacrifice has been made. The veil has been torn. When someone says, I know what you are going through, remember this about Jesus, that he knows what you are going through and what I am going through. 
So we carefully and confidently can come to the Lord. And even as we take the Lord's Supper, we carefully and confidently come to the Lord's table and we commune with Jesus, his body broken for us. We take the bread that represents his body and we commune with him. We confidently go because of what Jesus has done, not based on any merit. Yes, Paul says, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves before you come to the Lord's table. That would include our confession of Christ, that we have invited him to to be the one who keeps us accountable. We have said to the Holy Spirit, come, and you convict me, you teach me, you guide me. We commune with Jesus, we remember his body, and we remember his blood. That's why we come to the table, to remember him, to commune with him. Let me pray. Yes, Lord, we come before even entering into this sacred moment of taking the Lord's Supper that we take so seriously, but we confidently come because of what you've done, that your body was broken for us and your blood was shed for us to give us complete access to our Father, to the throne of grace, not on anything that we've done, not on our own merit, but only by faith alone, by grace alone, in Jesus alone, that's it. It's only by that that we come. And so we come. I invite you to come this morning. Come to Jesus, to the throne of grace. And he receives you. He receives you and me because he loves us, because he died for us. It's in Jesus' precious name that I pray, amen.